This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. This episode contains swearing, discussions about STDs, race, racism, slavery, and antiquated ideas and language about black people and African Americans. Please be considerate of those around you when listening. It's a hot summer's day in rural Alabama, July 1934. A black sedan rumbles along a dirt road, surrounded by lush greenery, a blue sky above, and sun baking the earth. A plume of dust trails behind the car until it slows down and turns into a narrow driveway. The car crawls along the narrow path, towards a tattered house perched just at the end of the drive. It's not so much a house, but a shack falling apart. It's completely unpainted with gray, dry wood completely exposed to the elements. Some of the shutters around the windows are hanging by a single hinge. That's if the frame even has a pane of glass in it at all. This place may not even have electricity. Not far behind the house is a dilapidated barn that looks much the same. There's a black woman seated in a rocking chair on the porch. She looks to be about in her mid-forties. She turns her head and yells into the house through the open door. The car stops and two people step out. One is a white man, maybe in his 50s, in gray pants and white collared short sleeve shirt that doesn't do well to hide his slight gut. The other is a black woman, and by the looks of it, a nurse, about in her 30s. The two approach the home, practically swimming in thick, humid air. A couple chickens scurry out of their way. A middle-aged black gentleman approaches from the door. He smiles and waves at the nurse. Stepping onto the porch, the four have a friendly conversation, exchanging small talk and pleasantries, but this visit has a dark undertone. The black man is a patient in some study at the Tuskegee Institute in town, and he's due for his exam because this nurse is helping cure his syphilis, right? The Tuskegee experiment was a study on untreated syphilis in black men in rural Macon County, Alabama. Running from 1932 to 1972, the doctors who ran the study wanted to know how syphilis, an infectious disease, progressed differently in black people than in white people. The idea was to entice poor and uneducated black farmers into this study by having them think they were being treated for bad blood a colloquial term that was used as a catch-all for a range of various diseases, when in fact the study participants were being severely undertreated for syphilis. But it was by the work of nurse Eunice Rivers, a black woman from rural Georgia, that the study was able to continue for 40 years as it did. We are going to see how the Tuskegee study was more racially complicated than it is often portrayed. Look at the people and the institutions behind the study, Examine the science and see how Tuskegee rattled the public trust in healthcare institutions to this day. Let's go to Alabama. Many of us carry some idea of what Alabama is like without having been there, myself included. Earning statehood in 1819, Alabama is in the southern United States bordering Georgia, Mississippi, Florida, and a bit of the Gulf of Mexico coastline that converges into Mobile Bay. Alabama is known for southern hospitality, fried food, and football. Fun fact, the Saturn V rockets that were produced in Huntsville, Alabama, were the same rockets that started the journey of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins on their mission to the moon. Areas like Tuscaloosa, way northwest of Tuskegee, are very lush and green. Thick pockets of forest surround Birmingham, Alabama, and when you start to get closer to the outskirts of any city, you are immediately surrounded by tall, thick trees on either side of the interstate or state highway. It feels more like stepping into a national park on some back roads, especially since so many of those forests are so empty. It stays green during the summer, even with high temperatures because of the humidity, which hangs in the air like a wet blanket. 
but makes many people who live there have very clear and moisturized skin. The humidity is so heavy, it sometimes feels like being crushed, especially when it approaches 85 to 90% humidity. On some college campuses, there is a very large dichotomy of white and black spaces. Faculty are overwhelmingly white at universities like University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, also called UA, while staff like food and janitorial services are almost predominantly black. UA doesn't really do the best job at acknowledging its previous status as a university that supported and benefited from slavery. As there are only three buildings that survived Sherman's march to the sea, one of which is a former slave quarters, which today is behind the president's mansion and has been rebranded as a, quote, garden shed, end quote. There is only one tiny monument to the slaves that built the university hidden behind the biology building, along with two graves. UA is also where the stand in the schoolhouse door happened, where the former governor of Alabama, George Wallace, said, quote, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever, end quote, as he stood to bar the first black students from entering. Apparently, UA doesn't talk about that. Religion is important to many Southerners. It can dictate what people wear, meaning people dress pretty conservatively in general, not showing much skin, and put on their Sunday best to go to church. Men will wear maybe a polo or a button-up with khakis and boat shoes, and women will wear dresses or nice skirts. Sporting fancy clothes at church can be more of a fashion spectacle than just showing up for Jesus. Religion can dictate what Alabamans believe, who they associate with, and how to vote. There is nothing more segregated in the South than how folks are divided on Sunday mornings. When visiting some places in Alabama, some people may invite you to church, include you in their Bible studies, or even ask to pray for you. Southern food is absolutely delicious, but full of stereotypes and prejudices. Classic Southern food like barbecue, biscuits, fried okra, cream corn, etc., were the main food staples of slaves that later became popular with their owners. There is also a large Hispanic population in Alabama due to the available jobs somewhat close to the border. So Tex-Mex and Mexican food is very popular as well. However, healthy food access is a huge issue because many areas don't have access to a grocery store. And instead, some people buy their food from Dollar General or the local gas station. Immigration and the prison system are both hot-button issues in Alabama, immigration in particular due to their high presence of immigrants. A prison is an issue in Alabama due in part to the series 60 Days in Jail, where the Etowah County Detention Center was featured in a season that aired earlier in 2020. According to an article in the Tuscaloosa News, it's a show where people in law enforcement, faith leaders, or lay people embed themselves in prison to see what it's like and how long they can take being a prisoner. Numerous sources claim Etowah Prison is one of the worst in the nation, but by what measure, I don't know. When it comes to healthcare, there is a large barrier to proper healthcare access in Alabama, partly because rural hospitals keep closing. But this isn't unique to Alabama. Rural medicine is an ongoing issue in the United States. Tuscaloosa County has hospitals, but some neighboring counties don't have any hospitals at all. Sanitation in rural areas is also an issue because some neighborhood planners didn't build septic tanks, so human waste had to be transported from pipes extending from houses into the forest behind it, creating horrible health issues and smells. Most of Alabama's black population is on Medicaid, and expansion of that program is slow and stubborn. There is also a large distrust towards white doctors among black citizens. Not to say that they won't go to a white doctor, but accounts from people who have shadowed physicians in Alabama show sometimes black patients' discomfort was palpable. Part of that discomfort is because of the Tuskegee experiments. Let's look within Alabama's interior at Macon County. Macon is roughly the same size as Oklahoma City in terms of area, but sparsely populated. Only about 19,000 people reside in Macon, which has decreased steadily since about 1950, according to the National Association of Counties. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2019, 
a little over 80% of Macon's residents were Black or African American. Less than 20% are white. In fact, Macon County is part of what is colloquially known as, quote unquote, the Black Belt in the American South, a mostly contiguous area of counties that extend from the Carolinas westward into the Deep South that have a majority Black population. Other sources say this area is called the Black Belt due to the rich soil. The economy of Macon comprises of several different industries, mostly education and manufacturing, according to Data USA. The census states that in 2018, the median household income was about $32,000 per year, and the median house value was a little under $80,000. The seat of government of Macon County resides in the small town of Tuskegee. In 2019, Tuskegee was home to a little over 8,000 residents, according to the Census Bureau. Only about a 40-minute drive east of Alabama's capital, Montgomery, Tuskegee is home to some very famous individuals. It's the birthplace of Rosa Parks. The Tuskegee Airmen, the first black combat pilots in the U.S. Army Air Corps, trained in Tuskegee. A major local event is the George Washington Carver Arts and Crafts Festival, dedicated to scientist George Washington Carver, who is buried in Tuskegee. There's even a museum in town named in his honor. It looks like a typical small American town, but with an extensive history. Tuskegee University is a historically black college founded in 1881, first as what's called a normal school, meaning it was founded as a school specifically to instruct future teachers. Today, Tuskegee U is not primarily a teacher's college. According to their website, the college has programs in business, nursing, and clinical laboratory science, to name a few, and includes undergraduate master's and doctoral programs. Their website says they are the only historically black college in the United States with four different engineering programs. Notable alumni from Tuskegee U include singer-songwriter Lionel Richie, Daniel James Jr., a fighter pilot and the first black man to become a four-star general in the United States Armed Forces, and commander of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, and Betty Shabazz, an educator and civil rights activist. She was formerly Betty X because she was the wife of Malcolm X until his death in 1965. Tuskegee University is where the infamous Tuskegee experiment would take place starting in 1932. This experiment can go by several different names, such as the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment or the United States Public Health Service Syphilis Experiment, but the study was officially titled, quote, Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, end quote. The purpose of this experiment was to observe how the infectious disease syphilis progressed in a sample of black patients. Some of my major sources for this episode include the Public Health Service, the CDC, the NIH, Public Health Departments of Boston and Columbia University, a paper titled Neither Victim Nor Villain by Susan Smith, and a lecture at Stony Brook University given by Dr. James Jones, Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Arkansas. He was actually involved with helping provide archival evidence of the study to the victim's attorney. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease caused by a bacteria called Treponema pallidum, a spiral-shaped gram-negative bacteria according to the Mayo Clinic. For their spiral shape, these bacteria are classified as spirochetes, a phylum that also includes the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Gram-negative It means these little guys have an outer membrane and an inner membrane separated by a cell wall. Treponema pallidum also has a flagellum spanning the length of their body that provides movement. Once infected with syphilis, you have what is called primary syphilis, where you may have a sore called a canker sore on your genitals, but it may be concealed so you may not even know you have been infected since the sores are often painless and heal within a few weeks. In secondary syphilis infection, you'll experience a rash on some parts of your body like your palms, abdomen, or even the soles of your feet, or this rash can cover your entire body in some cases. Some accompanying symptoms also include swollen lymph nodes, fever, and hair loss. Again, these symptoms may disappear or wax and wane. Next, the disease progresses to tertiary syphilis, where, according to the Mayo Clinic, about 15-30% to of patients develop complications including damage to the heart, liver, 
blood vessels, eyes, even the nervous system and the brain known as neurosyphilis. The scary thing is, these symptoms may take years to develop after the initial infection. Unfortunately, infants can also be born with syphilis. Congenital syphilis is transmitted either through the placenta or during birth. In 2017, the CDC estimated the incidence of primary and secondary syphilis at over 30,000 new cases in the United States. Historically, the first well-documented cases of syphilis occurred in 15th century Italy. Humans have been fighting with this disease for a long time, but the exact origins of treponema pallidum are unknown. But it can be treated with penicillin, which we will discuss later in this episode. I did find an NIH article stating that historical figures like Beethoven, Ivan the Terrible, and Al Capone could have been infected with syphilis. As far as where the name syphilis comes from, according to an NPR news interview from 2011 with Dr. Howard Markle, a professor of history of medicine at the University of Michigan, quote, the term syphilis really was a beloved literary character that was created by an eminent physician and poet and professor named Hieronymus Fessistorius. And he did this in 1530 where he wrote an epic poem called Syphilis Civ Morbus Gallicus or what's also known as syphilis or the French disease. And he wrote a poem about this mythical shepherd named Syphilis, who rejected and then insulted the sun god. And in response, the deity struck him down with the dreaded malady, and that's where the name comes from, end quote. Prior to the Tuskegee experiment, there was quite a bit of work done to isolate and create tests for syphilis in patients. Specifically in 1910, a German bacteriologist named August Wassermann was the first to produce a serologic test for syphilis, meaning he was able to detect the disease in certain bodily fluids. Then in 1949, American scientists Robert Nelson and Manfred Mayer created a specific test for treponema pallidum, according to the NIH. Point being is there existed a body of research in syphilis before the Tuskegee study. What was lacking at the time of the experiment was a treatment for syphilis. Before the discovery of penicillin, now the standard treatment for syphilis, heavy metals like mercury and bismuth were used in the 15th and 16th century. Later, syphilis would be treated with an antimicrobial drug called arsphenamine in the 19th century, according to the NIH. To be clear, the Tuskegee experiment was by no means conducted to find a treatment. Numerous sources support the idea that Tuskegee was to understand the progression of the disease specifically in black patients, but I am unclear if this means scientists and doctors already understood the progression of syphilis in white patients. However, it was the 1930s, so there exists an attitude of dismissal and ignorance regarding the health and well-being of black people, and certainly less infrastructure in terms of how clinical research is to be conducted in a safe and ethical manner. Today, clinical trials in both the United States and the European Union are regulated and controlled by many different international laws and institutional protocols study investigators must comply with to fit what's considered good clinical practice, or GCP. In the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, provides a framework in which drug companies must conduct clinical trials in phases to first test investigational therapies and demonstrate drug efficacy backed by statistical evidence to the fact. There is such a vast infrastructure in place now to protect human subjects and reduce risk. I don't want to get into the specifics because that alone could be its own episode. What was lacking at the Tuskegee study and is critical to the clinical research process today is informed consent. Essentially, informed consent is where the principal investigator or study team educates subjects on the trial and exactly what intervention is going to be done and when, how, why, etc. Take the ongoing COVID vaccine trials, for example. The doctors conducting these trials have a duty to educate study participants and make sure those participants understand what they're getting into and the potential risks and benefits. No action can be taken by the study team without a signed informed consent form on record for each subject. Before looking at the Tuskegee study design, we have to understand the two institutions critical to making this study happen the U.S. Public Health Service, and the Rosenwald Fund. 
The origin of the U.S. Public Health Service can be traced back to 1798, when President John Adams signed the Act for the Relief of Sick and Disabled Seamen, which provided the funding for the creation of marine hospitals along major American waterways. The network of marine hospitals expanded in 1801. In 1870, the Marine Hospital Service, predecessor to the Public Health Service, Organized under the leadership of a supervising surgeon, today the position of supervising surgeon is called Surgeon General, the first being John Maynard Woodworth, who turned the Marine Hospital Service into a military organization. They would go on to assist fighting various epidemics in the United States such as smallpox and yellow fever. In 1889, Congress established the United States Public Health Service Commissioned Corps, a uniformed arm of the Marine Hospital Service. In fact, my aunt works for the Commission Corps as a pharmacist at the rank of captain. In the early 1900s, the Commission Corps was tasked with conducting disease research, water storage and sanitation, and sewage disposal. In 1912, the Marine Hospital Service was officially changed to the Public Health Service, or PHS. World War II increased the Commission Corps' personnel from about 600 to 3,000. The Public Health Service has been involved in linking smoking to lung cancer in the 1960s and educating the public about AIDS in the 1980s. They also assisted with disaster relief in 2005 in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Of course, a dark spot on this otherwise outstanding record is the horror of the Tuskegee experiments. It was Surgeon General Hugh S. Cumming who initiated the syphilis study that would continue for the next six Surgeons General. For example, Surgeons General H. S. Cumming, Thomas Perrin, Leonard A. Scheele, and Leroy E. Burney all served over the four-year term limit now in place for that position. In fact, both Hugh S. Cumming and Thomas Perrin served over a decade as Surgeon General. Of the seven total Surgeons General that oversaw the Tuskegee experiment, HHS only mentions Tuskegee and Hugh Cummings' biography online. The Public Health Service was eventually called on by the Rosenwald Fund to help get the research off the ground. The Rosenwald Fund was created by Julius Rosenwald, a businessman at the helm of Sears, Roebuck & Company, or better known as the former retail giant Sears. Julius was born in 1862 to German-Jewish immigrants and grew up a few blocks from President Abraham Lincoln's home in Springfield, Illinois. His family was firmly middle class, but with his hard work and aptitude for the retail business, Julius became president of Sears and Roebuck and a millionaire by the age of 33. The Rosenwald Fund was created in 1917 to provide opportunities for Americans, such as funding schools in black communities in the rural South. But the fund was not designed to provide financing indefinitely. According to Tulane University's Amistad Research Center, quote, the Julius Rosenwald Fund provided over $70 million in funding to a variety of colleges and universities, Jewish charities, and African-American schools before its funds were exhausted in 1948, end quote. Julius was eventually introduced to Booker T. Washington, president of the Tuskegee Institute, who asked Rosenwald to serve on their board of directors. In addition to funding and building schools in the rural South, the fund also financed improving the health of these rural communities. Between the Public Health Service and the Rosenwald Fund, a foundation existed for the Tuskegee Studies initiation. Before 1932, and before the infamous version of the Tuskegee study, there was an iteration of this research that started off ethical and well-intentioned. We know Julius Rosenwald had a relationship with Booker T. Washington and served on the Institute's board, coupled with Rosenwald's preferred flavor of philanthropy of building up rural, black communities in the South. Rosenwald ventured into public health because Washington wanted to enhance the health and well-being of black students. Washington's reasoning was that a sick child shouldn't go to school when sick because, one, they could expose others, and two, a child can't perform well if they're feeling ill. So Washington inspires Rosenwald to finance public health infrastructure in the South. Rosenwald hired a man named Michael Davis, who he presumed knew more about black health than himself. And then Davis asked for assistance from the U.S. Public Health Service. Surgeon General Hugh Cumming appointed a man named Dr. Tolliver Clark to assist Davis and Rosenwald. Clark wanted to try and demonstrate they could cure syphilis, and he convinced Rosenwald to follow suit. They had the minds, the will, and the resources, and the Tuskegee study was born. 
In this original study, several black communities were selected for this experiment and stratified by six different socioeconomic backgrounds by country, with Albemarle County, Virginia being the most affluent, where Charlottesville and the University of Virginia are geographically located, to the poorest community being in Macon County, Alabama. A representative sample of black men only from each of the six communities was chosen and tested for syphilis. Those who tested positive for syphilis were able to seek treatment at various mobile clinics with treatments that included both arsphenamine and those heavy metal treatments which were standard at the time. The papers subsequently published from this trial showed Macon County had a syphilis infection rate of 35% compared to 7% in Arbemarle. More shocking was they found that of the 35% of cases in Macon County, most of those were congenital syphilis, meaning the subjects were infected with syphilis either in the womb or during birth, like I mentioned, meaning many of the poorest patients lived with syphilis from birth to death without ever seeking treatment despite the existence of the Tuskegee Institute Hospital. Looking at the disparity in infection rate between Macon and Arbemarle, the Public Health Service concluded that something could potentially be done about syphilis. Now, at this point in the 1930s, the Great Depression caused markets to collapse and thus caused the Rosenwald Fund to retract funding from their public health projects in the South since the fund relied on healthy sales of consumer products at Sears. Despite the loss of the Rosenwald Fund, Tolliver Clark wanted to continue the syphilis research based on the assumption that the disease progressed differently in black people than in white people. Clark hypothesized that untreated syphilis in black people increased the incidence of cardiac and vascular complications, whereas untreated syphilis in whites increased the incidence of neurosyphilis. And again, only men were being studied here. Clark appointed two physicians, Drs. Oliver Clarence Wegner and Raymond A. Vondelier, to assist with the next version of the research. Dr. Wegner was the director of Public Health Services Venereal Disease Clinic in Hot Springs, Arkansas and Dr. Vondelier was the on-site director at the Tuskegee Institute, who conducted many of the initial physical exams. Another public health service physician, Dr. John R. Heller, put together a control group for the study in 1933. He would later become director of the National Cancer Institute in 1960. Wegner and Vondelier tell the Macon County Black community that they intend to continue the original Rosenwald Fund study that includes treating syphilis, and they sold the community and community leaders on this plan because incentives for study participation included free medical care, hot meals, and transportation to and from appointments. Next, Wagner and Vondelier then approached the Tuskegee Institute and requested from the university president, then Dr. Robert Rusa Moten, Booker T. Washington's successor, to use the university hospital to conduct the experiment. However, Wagner and Vondelier this time do not lie to the Tuskegee Institute, meaning the Institute was fully aware the study physicians did not intend to treat their subject's syphilis. This study was endorsed by the black leadership at the Tuskegee Institute. As historian Dr. James Jones put it, quote, from the beginning, and this is what kind of messes up the simple morality play, the Tuskegee study has biracial support. Black educators and physicians who know what's going on agree to cooperate with it. So it's not one group solely against another. It's messier than that, more complicated, end quote. One of the black physicians who is also the head of Tuskegee's hospital is Dr. Eugene Dibble, who cooperates with the study. Another black physician involved was a pathologist named Dr. Jerome Peters. But the key figure in this study and this episode is a black woman named Eunice Rivers Laurie, or Eunice Rivers, or simply Nurse Rivers. Eunice Verdell Rivers Laurie was born in 1899 to a farming family in rural Georgia. She was the oldest of three daughters, and her parents encouraged her to pursue a career in nursing. Rivers' parents promoted education to each of their daughters so they could live a life better than toiling away in a farm. Their father consistently worked long hours at a sawmill to finance his three girls' educations. When Rivers was just 15, her mother died, but Rivers persevered through school. And in 1922, Rivers graduated from the Tuskegee Institute School of Nursing. 
The Tuskegee Institute held the philosophy of service to the rural poor as a top priority. Guided by Booker T. Washington's mission to improve conditions in the rural South, extension programs were created such as the Tuskegee Movable School. This mule-drawn wagon, and later a truck, carried graduates in various careers like nursing, agriculture, etc., to work with the rural poor. In fact, one of the movable school trucks is parked in the George Washington Carver Museum with the words, the Booker T. Washington Agricultural School on Wheels, printed on the side. These educators could go directly to rural people's homes to teach by example and gain the trust of their students. Black nurses in particular were key in spreading health knowledge, and specifically public health nurses could best assess the needs of these rural communities. For example, a woman named Yuva M. Hester, a Tuskegee nursing graduate, was the first black public health nurse to work in this movable school. While working with some of the poorest patients in these rural communities, Hester saw firsthand some of the squalid and pestilent conditions in which some of these people lived. In one account, Hester writes, quote, On Tuesday, I visited a young woman who had been bedridden with tuberculosis for more than a year. There are two openings on her chest and one in the side, from which pus constantly streams. In addition, there is a bed sore on the lower part of the back, as large as one's hand. There were no sheets on the bed. These sores had only a patch of cloth plastered over them. No effort was made to protect the patient from the flies that swarmed around her, end quote. Nurse Rivers joined the ranks of these movable schools in January 1923 as a public health nurse. She often provided information about how to keep a home clean and sanitized to women, as women at this time were more expected to be homemakers, whereas the messages for men would be focused on preventing venereal diseases. In 1926, Rivers was transferred to work with the Alabama Bureau of Child Welfare to focus on creating birth and death records and provide education on midwifery, but she continued to do a lot of traveling within Alabama. To get a sense of the scale of these movable schools, Nurse Rivers alone saw hundreds of patients each month. She distinguished herself with her charm and conduct. She made people feel good in her presence, and her patients remembered her. A part of this, according to Susan Smith, comes from Nurse Rivers' ability to empathize with her rural patients because she has a similar background from her farming upbringing in Georgia. Her patient-provider relationships were founded on mutual life experience and then built on mutual respect. These experiences as a public health nurse practicing in this environment with these particular patients is what made her so important from the perspective of the public health service. The Great Depression ended her job with the movable schools, and she got a job as a night supervisor at the Tuskegee Institute's John A. Andrew Hospital. Almost a year goes by before she applies for a job with the federal government, which intrigued her because Nurse Rivers was somebody who wanted to expand her skills and experience, but also because she hated the night shift. She got the job with the Public Health Service on a part-time basis, and to this new role, not only did she bring experience from the movable schools and knowledge of Alabama and Macon County, she provided the way to speak to this patient population to gain their trust. The Public Health Service managed to initiate this new version of the study with 600 men, 399 infected with syphilis, and 201 controls. Each man was given a physical exam and other tests like x-ray or electrocardiogram. Sometimes lumbar punctures were performed, but the men oftentimes didn't know beforehand this was going to happen. If a subject in the control group became infected with syphilis, they would be simply switched to the treatment group. Contrary to the desires of the study physicians and the study's title, no subject was completely untreated. The chief health officer of Alabama at that time, a physician named Dr. Baker, informed Dr. Clark the public health service was not allowed to conduct their experiment without treating the subjects. However, Dr. Clark did not want to treat the patient's syphilis at all. Eventually, he relented, but only partially. The treatments provided were the arsphenamine and mercury treatment that I mentioned, both of which were standard before penicillin. However, treating patients with these drugs requires time and skill. A physician needed to monitor their patients on these therapies carefully to adjust the dose and address the patient's response over an appropriate duration. Such careful treatment detail was not provided in the Tuskegee experiment. 
and no medicine provided was enough to actually kill spirochete. In modern clinical trials, the point of having a control group and a treatment group of which receives only one intervention in a randomized double-blind framework is to control for confounding or outside factors that could distort the results. If the point of the Tuskegee study was to observe untreated syphilis and the researchers gave even a small dose of medicine, then the study was, at its onset, bullshit research from a clinical trial perspective, not to mention the disregard for human rights. According to historian James Jones, 14 papers total were published using the Tuskegee research, and each paper claims the research looked at untreated syphilis. In my own opinion, this could partially be why there is a misunderstanding out there that Tuskegee subjects were completely untreated when in fact they were undertreated. Some patients in very latent stages of syphilis suffered symptoms such as ulcerated cutaneous syphilis, where open and scabbed sores or lesions appear on the skin. Eventually, untreated syphilis kills you by causing damage to multiple organs. In 1933, Dr. Tolliver Clark retired, and Dr. Von der Leer was promoted to the director of the Division of Venereal Disease, enabling the Tuskegee study to continue. Historian James Jones thinks the experiment continued for 40 years because the public health service promotes internally, thus facilitating a bureaucratic pattern in which young clinicians that work on Tuskegee are promoted and upon their retirement promote somebody else that worked on Tuskegee. According to Dr. Jones, this means the study never really had a fresh pair of eyes to recognize bad, bad science. The other thing that allowed the Tuskegee study to continue for 40 years was economic. The study was very cheap to conduct. Nurse Rivers was the study point person who could develop rapport with the subjects in the community, and once a year the doctors would travel to Macon County to perform examinations and autopsies. In 1937, an opportunity presented that would have allowed Tuskegee subjects to obtain treatment appropriately. A new Surgeon General, Dr. Thomas Perrin, piloted a syphilis treatment program based on the Rosenwald Fund syphilis study. Mobile clinics were sent into the south and rural communities to test for and treat syphilis. When a mobile clinic arrived in Tuskegee, however, Nurse Rivers appeared at the event and told the clinical staff which men not to treat because they were enrolled in the Tuskegee study. Those men were disqualified from treatment and asked to leave. In 1941, the Japanese Empire attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, causing the United States to join the Allies in World War II. The U.S. Armed Forces quickly moved to draft able-bodied young men into service, which would have included some of the Tuskegee study subjects. However, the Surgeon General wrote letters to the local draft boards in Macon and other counties in Alabama, identifying men involved in the study. If they were drafted, the subjects would be tested and found to have syphilis, and then treated, which couldn't happen. After the end of the Second World War, prominent leaders in Nazi Germany's government were put on trial for war crimes, such as medical experiments on prisoners in concentration camps. Apparently, public knowledge of the Nuremberg trials didn't give anybody at the Public Health Service second thoughts about continuing the Tuskegee study. Historian James Jones once interviewed Dr. Heller, future director of the National Cancer Institute, to address this question. In his lecture, Jones describes the interaction, quote, Dr. Heller, Did you guys ever talk about the Tuskegee experiment with regard, you know, any juxtaposition going on there in your minds about Nuremberg and Tuskegee? What about it? And there was a long pause, and then a light bulb goes off over his head. And Dr. Heller says, are you inferring that I'm a Nazi? Are you calling me a Nazi? End quote. Dr. Heller then dismissed Jones from the interview. The most despicable denial of the subject's syphilis treatment came with the discovery of penicillin. Penicillin was discovered by Scottish physician Alexander Fleming. Definitely a future CT topic, Fleming observed in a petri dish that no Staphylococcus bacteria colonies formed around a colony of blue mold called Penicillium, a genus of fungi. Penicillin describes a family of different antibiotics that have different chemical structures and uses. For example, a group called semi-synthetic penicillin, such as methicillin, oxicillin, and nafcillin, can attack many gram-positive bacteria. Other groups, like amino penicillins, which include ampicillin and amoxicillin, can attack gram-negative bacteria. 
Furthermore, ampicillin and amoxicillin can be coupled with another compound that block a certain receptor protein on bacteria cell membranes in order to stop the production of enzymes that would render the antibiotics alone useless. Initiated by Fleming's discovery, additional trials and refining led to penicillins suitable for human use, the production of which increased markedly for World War II. According to the NIH, the specific type of penicillin used against syphilis is benzathine penicillin G, the chemical structure of which contains a beta-lactam ring that inhibits the spirochete's ability to synthesize its cell wall. According to the CDC, other antibiotics like doxycycline can be used with patients allergic to penicillin. Though penicillin replaced arsphenamine and mercury treatments, this was not the case for the Tuskegee subjects. A similar study of untreated syphilis in Sweden was stopped and its subjects treated with penicillin upon its availability. Not even the civil rights movement was enough to change the minds of the doctors in charge of Tuskegee. The beginning of the end of the Tuskegee study came when a man named Peter Buxton discovered some of the publications produced from the study. A social worker by trade, Buxton's job was to conduct epidemiological follow-ups. He did what could be considered contact tracing, but for STDs. Buxton discovered some of the publications written on Tuskegee and was rightfully horrified. When he asked his supervisors at the public health service, they instructed him to drop the matter, which he didn't because Buxton was a persistent man. He ended up writing to some of the higher-ups at the CDC, and they flew him to Atlanta in 1969. He was taken to the CDC director's conference room, where he was confronted by several public health service officers and berated, saying he couldn't possibly understand the science since he was a social worker, not a scientist or a physician. Which is a fair criticism, since it's true, Buxton is not a scientist. However, since the officers knew the study on so-called untreated syphilis actually provided minimal treatment the whole time, that was a bullshit argument to make. By the way, they flew Buxton to Atlanta on the taxpayer's dime just to yell at him. Now, Buxton leaves Atlanta, and he seems to have flown under the radar for a little while until he wrote a letter pointing out that despite not being a scientist or physician, he recognized unethical practices when he saw them, and tells them that maybe a jury should decide what kind of murder has occurred. <laughs> this got their attention enough to invoke an internal public health service review of the study in 1969. The review panel consisted of all white public health service officers who all worked on Tuskegee except for Dr. Jean Stollerman. A little about Dr. Stollerman. According to an article published in the Memphis Medical News, Stollerman was born in New York City in 1920. He graduated from Dartmouth College in 1941 and attended medical school at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He did his residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City and was later inducted into the United States Army Medical Corps. Stollerman's area of interest was the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of streptococcal infections, acute rheumatic fever, and rheumatic heart disease. All right, class. Can I get your attention, please? Today we're going to start with a pop quiz on the Tuskegee experiment per yesterday's lecture. Now put your name on a piece of paper and write the letter corresponding to what you think the correct answer is. When you are done, pass this, fold the paper and pass it up to the front. The question is, what was the 1969 Public Health Service Review Panel's dis decision regarding the Tuskegee syphilis study? Was it A, stop the study and treat the patients? B, stop the study and treat the patients and haul those responsible to court for violations of human rights? C, stop the study, treat the patients, and haul those responsible to court for violations of human rights and strip doctors Clark, Vondelier, Wagner, and Nurse Rivers of their credentials? Or D, enhance the statistical analysis of the study only? You have a few seconds to answer. Thank <laughs> you. 
If you guessed D, enhance the statistical analysis only, you're both cynical and correct. The conclusion that this review panel reached was to make sure the numbers were sound and enhance the rigor of the statistical analysis because, as their reasoning went, they owed it to the subjects who died to see the study through. The end point of this study was intended to be when the last patient died. And I want to point out that Dr. Stallerman disagreed with this consensus. In 1972, Peter Buxton had left the public health service to attend law school. He consulted a professor about litigation with respect to Tuskegee. The professor dissuaded Buxton from pursuing this due to statute of limitations and lack of evidence other than the published papers Buxton had in his possession. What I mean by lack of evidence is they would have needed records from the study as well as autopsy reports showing that the subjects died as a result of complications due to untreated syphilis, neither of which Buxton had. Instead, he presented these papers to a journalist named Edith Letterer at the Associated Press. Unfortunately, Letterer couldn't pursue the story because she was supposed to be covering events in Asia. The story was passed on to another AP reporter, Jean Heller, not to be confused with Dr. John Heller, who I mentioned earlier. Jean Heller investigated the matter by contacting the CDC and reading the papers provided to her by Peter Buxton. She then published four articles about the Tuskegee experiment, causing public outcry and spelling the end of the study. In the wake of public knowledge about the Tuskegee study, attorney Fred Gray, the same attorney who represented both Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. following the Montgomery bus boycott, filed a lawsuit on behalf of both the surviving Tuskegee study subjects and the estates of the deceased. By 1972, 28 men died from syphilis, and 100 more passed from complications. The public health service acted as you would expect, by quickly trying to divert blame and not holding themselves accountable for the study. The government ended up settling out of court with the survivors and the estates of the deceased, According to the CDC, in 1974, a $10 million cash settlement was reached, as well as lifetime medical care and burial services to the survivors. In 1975, the wives, widows, and children of the survivors were added to this program called the Tuskegee Health Benefit Program, now managed by the CDC. This change benefited the families because at least 40 of the subjects' wives were infected with syphilis, and thus bore children with congenital syphilis during their spouse's enrollment in the trial. The last Tuskegee survivor passed away in 2004. Nobody was ever prosecuted for the conduct of the experiment, according to an article in the Equal Justice Initiative. In the aftermath of Tuskegee, according to Boston University School of Public Health, Congress passed the National Research Act of 1974 and established a health and human services policy for protection of human research subjects. Today, all research in the United States involving human subjects must be approved by an Institutional Review Board, or IRB. Tuskegee also led to the creation of the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. Charged with identifying the fundamental ethical principles that should guide research with human subjects. In 1978, the Commission published a report titled the Ethical Principles and Guidelines for the Protection of Human Subjects in Research. This piece is also known as the Belmont Report, which established three ethical principles for all human subjects' research, respect of persons, beneficence, and justice. In 1997, a film titled Miss Evers' Boys, starring Alfre Woodard as Nurse Rivers, was released. And, according to the CDC, that same year, the federal government issued a formal apology for the Tuskegee study. In 2004, the CDC provided $10 million to establish the Tuskegee University National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare, which formally opened in 2006. Now, just a few more things that I want to touch on before the end. No previously syphilis-free subject was ever purposely infected with syphilis in this trial. The syphilis cases were congenital or venereal. Tuskegee was not a secret classified study since at least 14 papers were published using Tuskegee data in several major medical publications. If anyone ever tells you Tuskegee was a secret, they're wrong, and you can tell them why. In fact, first ask them if Tuskegee was a secret, how was it uncovered, and see what creative answers they come up with. 
One odd thing I discovered on a frequently asked questions page on CDC's website was the question, quote, when did the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee become unethical, end quote. To which the answer is, quote, the study became unethical in the 1940s when penicillin became the recommended drug of treatment for syphilis and researchers did not offer it to the subjects, end quote, which I have to say, I disagree with the CDC on this. The study became unethical when Dr. Tolliver Clark succeeded in continuing the study first without providing treatment, undertreating the patients, and having his underlings lie to their subjects, but tell the truth to the Tuskegee Institute staff years before the discovery of penicillin. I'm surprised this is on CDC's website. If somebody can find a well-reasoned answer to this, email me. I'd love to know. I mentioned the endpoint of this study was intended to be when the last patient died, and that the last survivor passed in 2004. I can only speculate it's possible without intervention from ethical people like Peter Buxton, Tuskegee could have continued until 2004. Keep in mind, however, that the last survivor, a man named Ernest Hendon, was receiving free medical benefits. It's possible he lived to the age of 96 partly because of those benefits. Several sources indicated Nurse Rivers retreated into private life after the experiment was exposed in 1972. She herself was never prosecuted for her role in the Tuskegee study. Some people say she was powerless to oppose the public health service and the white medical establishment. Others say she was a complicit race traitor. And some claim she had little to no knowledge of the extent of the experiment or its intentions. Nurse Rivers is complicated. Historians have provided plenty of evidence showing Nurse Rivers knew exactly what was happening. In fact, her name appears first on one of the papers published about untreated syphilis from the Tuskegee study. By Nurse Rivers' own account, she said, quote, I don't have any regrets. You can't regret what you did when you knew you were doing right. I know from my personal feelings how I felt. I know I did good on working with the people. I know I didn't mislead anyone, end quote. My own opinion, and this is coming from somebody that is not a historian, is that Nurse Rivers managed to reach a certain level of success in her career, which, given her background coming from poverty, it was something she probably only ever dreamed of and didn't want to squander the opportunity to have a better life and help people. Yes, her parents guided her into nursing, but that doesn't mean she didn't desire to help people through the practice of patient care. She hits her stride with the movable school, enjoys the work, and she notices the impact she has on people. Then the depression hit, and she lost her job. There were people much wealthier than her who were completely ruined by the economic downturn. She could have been facing serious financial trouble, and why would she want to return to a life resembling her childhood? Facing this prospect, she exploited the fact that she was a great nurse and takes these part-time jobs. While working for the public health service, she's able to fall into that pattern of work that she did while employed with the movable school. I don't want to make it seem like she did what she did purely because of economics, but we have to consider the major event of the Depression driving her decision-making to seek employment with the public health service and keeping that job. Most of what I read in researching this topic focused on a lack of power, betraying her race, or naively thinking that she was somehow helping as a reason for her tenure at Tuskegee. These reasons play a part. I'm not saying those reasons are complete crap. I'm saying economics is a powerful force in all of our lives. Nurse Rivers being a black woman in the rural South before civil rights, without the internet to help her with a job search, recognized the opportunity cost of leaving the public health service was perhaps poverty. Even after the Depression ended, economic opportunity, economic opportunities for African Americans were not the same for white people. Without the Depression, Nurse Rivers still faces being a black woman in the rural South before civil rights without the internet to search for jobs. She must have done a lot of mental gymnastics to be okay with what she did and to think it was the right thing to do. Her thinking is also consistent with the black leadership at the Tuskegee Institute, willing to endorse this abhorrent treatment of their fellow people. But that institutional compliance on part of black leaders and physicians, I cannot wrap my head around. 
The quest for power over others is a human disease worse than syphilis. I thought this episode would be an appropriate segue from the previous one on how black people are treated in U.S. healthcare, but also relevant to the time we are living in. When I first started working on this episode in October, I found Dr. James Jones's lecture on YouTube, and it was, for the most part, just one of those lectures hardly anybody watches without any inflammatory comments. Now looking at that lecture again in December, post-COVID vaccine, and I realize this episode will probably release in January, the recent comments look very different, some of which claim that the fact Tuskegee even happened is a reason not to take the COVID vaccine. This demonstrates one of the longest-lasting effects of the Tuskegee study, a tarnish on the public trust in healthcare institutions, especially clinical research. African Americans and other groups are underrepresented in clinical trials compared to their white peers. And this is partially due to Tuskegee. So the ghost of Tuskegee exists, but there is hope. A few weeks ago, Sandra Lindsay, a critical care nurse at Long Island Jewish Medical Center in Queens, New York, was the first healthcare worker in New York to receive the coronavirus vaccine. The image of a black nurse being inoculated by another black woman stands in stark contrast to the images of Tuskegee. Thanks for listening. If you want to get in contact with the show with questions, comments, and constructive criticism, email cttpodcast at gmail.com. The show is on Instagram and Facebook at CT the Head. Please leave a five-star review if you feel so inclined and a comment. It really helps out the show. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and many other platforms. Special thanks to one of my peers for the information about Alabama. Also, check out my friend Spencer's podcast, Long Lost Explorer, on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other platforms. Special thanks goes out to my buddy Johnny for being willing to want to do the sound editing on this episode. Give your informed consent before you move forward in a clinical trial. Don't experiment on people. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday and happy new year. I'll see you in the next one. It's going to be a look back at 2020. And in that episode, I'll let you know which one is going to come up next after that. Wow, Dr. Dr. Heller, I'm so glad you decided that you wanted to come uh, sit down and uh, be interviewed by me. It's uh, it's an honor. Um I understand that you you threw uh, James Jones out of your office because he uh, accused you of being a Nazi. Uh, well, I, you know, we're not going to go there. Uh, we're not going to go there. But uh honestly, you have a lot more feathers than I would expect from a physician of your caliber. <laughs>